is a first time tower here for us, the people tree. Uh, Ricky Schilling, she grew up in New Jersey. Um, she came to storytelling like you like used to. She came to storytelling listening to her father and her grandmother talk and tell stories. And it's something that I think the newer generation is missing. Is at these family events, their faces are buried in their phones and they're missing the, the stories about their families. So this is how, uh, how Ruth came to it. They share stories whether you want to listen to them or not. She's an empty nester with two young adults. She's a wealth management professor by day, an avid yoga and reiki practitioner. She sees life as a journey to be explored. Let's get our first time Keep the Street Teller, Ruth Easterling, up here. I was looking at 138 people. We expected 30, hoped for 40. They are sitting in one of the seven churches in the village. The walls were made of clay blocks that came from the ground of Kasum, and the roof was a deep, dark, thick patch. Sometimes a small snake or a lizard or something black and fuzzy with legs fell down. I just didn't want it to fall on me. The people sat on benches made of the same clay blocks with a simple plank laid across them. The men were on my right wearing their one set of their clothes, and the women on the left were chatangas, cloths of bright reds, greens, yellows, blues, purples. Some had headdresses. They were amazingly beautiful. And the children, the children were looking through the door and the windows in the back with big smiles to see the people from the United States. And every now and then the stern leader would say, shoo, shoo, and shoo them away. But when no one was looking, I would encourage them to come back. We had a lot of fun that week. I still cannot believe I was in rural Africa. It had truly been a dream of mine since I was a child. My friend Doug with Willow Creek Church had reached out and asked me to be part of the team. I said, no, I'm not a teacher. No credentials, not who I am, sorry. I'm a wealth management professional. I mean, I this just is nothing to do with a rural village in Africa and teaching grief. So naturally, I was on the team. And during the six weeks that we went through training, this thought hung over me. Who am I to teach people in rural Africa? In addition, we learned two very important things. One, you don't talk about poverty, and you don't talk about cultural issues because you can't fix those in a short time. You're there to empower the people. But it came to be a week before we are going to leave, and guess what? I had no materials pulled together. In fact, I was totally in my head about, I just don't know how to do this. I'm not a teacher. In addition to that, I had all this information. I'm like, teachers would know how to organize this information. So I connected to my yoga practice. I meditated. I sat in stillness. I let go of judgment. I let go of fear, and I centered on one thought. What do these people need to know? And in that stillness, I did have an inspiration. It's our humanity. It's our common experiences. And in two hours, I had that teaching plan done and the presentation, and here I was, ready to go. Standing next to me was Charles. Charles was as tall and dark as I am petite and fair. He exuded leadership, charisma, strength, integrity. And he was like my big comfy blanket standing there. He was also the interpreter. I started by asking a question. What would you like to know about grief? Now this is a village where the average age is 40. Everyone knew about grief. I had two hands raised. I was looking forward to the conversations about their emotions and how they felt about this. The first said, my brother has died. I cannot afford to take care of his family. I cannot afford to take care of my own family. The second said, the witch doctor, the witch doctor is a problem. How do we pay him? I'm two for two on things I'm not supposed to talk about. And I just acknowledged it like this was in the plan and I wrote it down and just figured we Get back to the later. The next step was to distribute our handouts. Now we had 40 copies and 138 people. We had met beforehand with the leaders and everyone agreed we would give them to the healthcare volunteers in the village. These were people who went around and checked on the sick and dying. 
So naturally, we would give it to them. In the U.S., this is a great idea, so organized, so well put together. But we're in a village of extreme poverty. I mean, everything you own, you know you own. And you are acutely aware of what you don't have. And you're very aware if there's something that becomes available that you would like to have, like paper. And I walked right into that. Charles explained what we would do and asked the healthcare volunteers, raise your hand. And I started to walk down the center of the church, the center aisle, and give them out. And as I looked to the right and to the left, I saw faces looking confused and scared. They were kind of questioning. And I got them back to the middle of the church, and by then everyone had their hand raised. I didn't know who was a healthcare volunteer anymore. And they were waving and waving, and then suddenly I saw a hand grab. I saw another hand grab. I heard people yelling and screaming. They were jumping, and they were in front of me and back of me in the aisle. I had started a riot. I'd been there 10 minutes. I raised two things we're not supposed to talk about, and now there was a riot. I clutched the rest of the handouts. I went over, and I thought I was safe. But I really wasn't sure, and suddenly I heard a foot stomp. I heard a hand clap and a voice, sure and strong, start singing. It was Charles, Charles, and just as quick as that energy went into chaos, everyone sat down and was singing a song and clapping their hands. Okay, everyone's smiling. I'm a go-with-the-flow kind of girl. This is cool. I'm with you. Then Doug came up, and he explained that we are not there to talk about money or the witch doctor. We are there to talk about your heart and how grief affects you inside. Because if you are not well inside, you cannot take care of yourself. You can't take care of your children, your family, your community. It was then my turn to come up and begin with this teaching. And I had decided that it would be a good way to start a foundation of relationship with these people if I shared my story. We'd have that common experience. But I had never shared this story before, and actually I'd really never thought about it until I was about to go up there. And suddenly as I walked up, it was like a really dark black abyss. And I thought, can I do this? Can I really do this? I said, dear God, please just give me the words. And I explained how I would talk about my experience, then I would talk about the emotions, I would name those emotions, and then we would talk, talk about how I heal. I explained how over two years, I went through the end of my marriage in a, of 28 years, in a divorce, and with that I lost our home, the one I had built to give safety and security to my children, and the cornerstone for me. And within those two years, in six-month period, I lost my mother, my sister, two cousins, and my foster father, all unexpectedly. And then, because what not, everything else was kind of falling apart, my career took a bend, and I lost my position. And it came from a woman I had helped promote in advancing her career. She later apologized, but by then I really I didn't care. I didn't care about much. And I talked about how I felt during this time. How initially I was in denial. I didn't talk to anyone. I didn't want anyone to know. I didn't want to know. And then it turned into fear. And then tears. Anxiety. Loneliness. Abandonment. Sometimes I didn't want to go out. And sometimes I just wanted to run away. Anger. Frustration. And then I talked about how I healed. Gradually I started to talk to trusted friends and family and advisors how I started to do service projects so I could get out of myself. I journaled, I wrote, I got things out. I went for long walks, I connected with nature to think of something bigger. I meditated, I did a lot of yoga, I prayed. I danced, I sang, and boy, I conquered grief. I walked right through it, I was doing great. I had moved on with my life, and in fact, I started to rebuild my life. I met a man who said he loved me, and we became engaged. Then one night, I received a text from this man. Do not call me. I do not want to hear from you again. I felt the numbness again. But something different happened this time. I started to shake. I started to shake really hard. I started to kind of pace and walk around. 
And in fact, all night long, I, I shook. I couldn't sleep, I couldn't talk. I, I thought I was going crazy. I didn't understand what was happening. And as soon as the morning came, we couldn't come early enough. I called my brother. And I just talked for a little while. There was no feelings, and then suddenly a tear. And then sobs came from somewhere deep inside. I didn't know I had, and I sobbed. I sobbed that day, and I sobbed the next day. And at this most vulnerable point in sharing my story, the men of Pasuga started to laugh. You're laughing at me? You're laughing at me? You think I'm some foolish woman? I wanted to run out of that church. I want to get it out of that village. I didn't sign up for this. I felt so humiliated. But something inside said, if I stop now, everything I just shared is for naught. The whole week is gone. I gave them the finger, the mom finger. <laughs> and then I gave them the mom look. Don't you mess with me. And I looked at each one in the eye and said, do not laugh at this. Do not laugh. Do not laugh at this. It had nothing to do with that man. That was grief. Because that's what grief does. It's one of the most powerful emotions. You'll think you were well, but if you have not healed, it stays inside of you. It does not just go away. Today you may feel fine, but tomorrow you may feel anger that you don't understand. Today you may feel great, but tomorrow you want to just cry and want everyone to leave you alone. Because that's how grief works. It may not be today, it may not be tomorrow, maybe next year, but something in your life will happen again. It will trigger grief and you it will knock you down like a wind that knocks over your house. You could have heard a pin drop. They got that. So for the next week, we did our lesson, and we did role-playing. In the role-playing, we incorporated situations about the witch doctor and poverty. We didn't try to solve it, but we gave them a new language and a perspective to think about, if they wanted to. And on the last day, as I was cleaning out my tent, came, someone came up and said, there had been a woman waiting for me at the door of the compound. They brought her in. It was Lenora. We had asked Lenora to take the lead with the grief support group that we had formed to take the skills they learned out to the village. Lenora walked up to me with pride and kindness, looked at me, and she said, I've come to thank my teacher. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Great first time teller for us. Ruth, thank you.